So I'm now going to pass over to Dr. Liz Murphy, consultant rheumatologist in Lanarkshire, who will be updating us on the Scottish Quality Registry. OK, so thank you very much for um, inviting me to, to speak to you this morning. It's a great pleasure to be here um, and, and thank you very much for that invitation. Um, I'm going to speak to you this morning about one of the projects that Claire has already alluded to and which Ilsa and some other NRAS members have been involved with. So this is a project which we've been um, running in Scotland. We'll talk just in a moment or two a little bit about what the, the details of the project were. Um, but to give you a little bit of background, what, what we have developed was a, a software application which was there to help us focus on communication between patients and clinicians because we understand that dialogue is incredibly important and Claire has already spoken very eloquently about the principles behind self-management. And we're well aware that in traditional consultations when patients come to see clinicians, whether that's their consultant or nurses or other members of the team, um, there's a lot going on. Often it can be very medicalised and patients sometimes come away thinking that they didn't really discuss the things that are important to them or they've been given a lot of information. They feel quite overwhelmed and, and they forget some of what they were told. Everybody does that. Um, and we know from evidence in the literature and from other countries that um, implementing what was called a quality based registry and that's a little bit of jargon that we perhaps need to find a, a better way of describing it but these sorts of tools um, improve communication and share decision making between patients and clinicians um, and I think it's important at this stage to say that although some of what we focused on was technology based this wasn't a project about technology this was a project all about improving dialogue between clinical teams and patients um, and so what we did was we um, developed a real-time service that allowed um, shared decision-making during the consultations. It allowed us to record some patient outcome measures, and we'll tell you what those were in a moment or two, um, and it helped in the self-management and symptom tracking from the patient point of view. Um, we did a, a pilot study which recruited patients with rheumatoid arthritis from two pilot sites um, in Greater Glasgow and Clyde and in NHS Lanarkshire and some of you on the call today may have been some of those patients. Um, patients were told what the, the trial was all about and what we did in the pilot was while patients were waiting in the waiting room to come into their consultations and um, they were given an iPad tablet where they got some questions. We used the MSKHQ questionnaire, but we also had some open ended questions, for example, asking patients what they wanted to talk about in the consultation. Um, and then as soon as they completed that, which took uh, on an average about eight or nine minutes, um, some people did it in less than five, some people took about 15 um, just pinged on one little box in the iPad and then that was immediately available for the consultant. So the patient came in to see the consultant a few minutes later, all that data was there on the consultant screen and the patient and the consultant could look at it together. And then from the consultant screen, there was also the ability for them to put in information that would have been discussed at normally in any consultation. So elements of the DAS28 score um, to write in about medication and any changes in medication. And at the end of the consultation, a little note was made about any action points. So if there'd been any changes in medication, for example, or if a decision had been made to refer to physiotherapy or anything at all, um, that was put in a little note session. And all those elements, so what the doctor had noted in terms of tender and swollen joints or ESR or medication, what the patient had identified and the elements of the MSKHQ, um, any actions that had been agreed, that was all created into a single a summary slide made into a PDF file and printed off and the patient was given it away to, to take home with them. Um, we evaluated the pilot obviously and, and what we found was extremely positive so even patients who were a little bit um, apprehensive at the start because they thought it was all about technology and computers and iPads found that it was very straightforward and we had even the most apprehensive of patients telling us that they found it was very easy and they thought they would be able to do it from home, which is the next phase of our study. Um, patients really valued the, the printed out PDF because, as I say, everybody forgets some of what they talk about in a consultation and it meant that it was there as a reminder. It was there maybe just to look at before their next appointment or it was there for them to discuss with their family when they got home or with their GP. And also, um, in terms of the identifying in advance what people wanted to talk about in the clinic, 
There was nothing came up that we wouldn't have expected patients to talk to us about before, but many people commented that it was a really good aid memoir before they went in to just highlight that they did want to talk about vaccination or they did want to talk about pain control or whatever, and it was there and it meant everything was covered. Um, so it was a good way of just reminding them what they wanted to do and what they wanted to talk about. Um, and this is just an example of the sort of printout that would come out. This is a, a test patient. So you can see here that we've got a note of the tender and swollen joints. Uh, in the what matters to me, that was the free text box. That was what the patient had identified that they wanted to talk about in the consultation. So here we've got sleep, mood, medication, um, very common things for people to talk about. Um, the comment um, was made that there was concern about infections over the coming winter. Um, and how can I access a disabled parking badge? So again, just these sorts of things that it was giving patients license, if you like, to feel that they were in control of the consultation and discussing all the things that they might want to do as well as what the clinicians focus on, which is often joint scores and medication. And then the note at the bottom was what had been agreed. So it says treatments to be escalated, patients have been sent off screening for biologic therapy, discuss seasonal flu vaccine, referred to occupational therapy for fatigue management and they were given information on a blue badge um, and that printout was on a single A4 sheet and the patient got it to take away. So what were the results? Um, we used a, a shared decision making tool called Collaborate which assesses how well patients felt that they were involved in the consultation. When we did it before the intervention 78% gave us top scores um, and we, that went up to 93% um, in patients who'd use this. Um, we did some feedback in including follow-up phone calls and 95% of patients were generally very positive. 68% told us that it helped them remember what to raise during the consultation and almost 90% said they'd be willing to try using it at home and about the same number um, said that they thought it was something that they would like us to continue. There were, as you might expect, just some issues with local IT support, a few technical issues initially with the iPads, um, and so on, but these are all things that we might have anticipated. So what are our next steps? We're hoping to roll this out in Scotland and, and currently actively trying to get funding to do this. Um, the pilot was really, um, for each patient, they just did it once, but obviously we see that there would be even greater benefits in using, using it sequentially so that people can compare um, one visit's results from the next. We're looking at doing it remotely so that people can use this from their home using smartphones, iPads, laptops, whatever. Um, and obviously that then also gives us the opportunity for patients to feed in this kind of information between face-to-face -face appointments. So either in advance of a telephone or video consultation, or perhaps just when they need to make contact between appointments to say my joints are flaring, things aren't so good, or my medication's not working. And we're also looking at extending the problems that we can use. So as I say, we, for the pilot, we use the MSKHQ, but really there's no limit to what other um, questionnaires and problems we can use. Um, and we're working closely with ELSA and others. And one possibility, for example, is that we would have an automatic link to the new to RA or the living with RA modules, which would be really exciting. Um, and finally, um, it wouldn't be right for me not to acknowledge all those who helped. So we had fantastic support from NRAS and I think Sheila McLeod has to get a particular mention. Sheila has been involved in this project from the beginning and was really instrumental um, both in driving it forward and in giving us lots of practical advice about the questions and, and the, the format and, and how it looked to complete it as a patient. We had support from the Scottish Society from Rheumatology, from the two health boards that we trialled it in. Um, it was sponsored by NHS Quality Improvement Scotland and they remain very supportive. Cohesion Medical are the company who developed it um, and um, all the clinical teams who helped us and last but not least um, all the patients who completed it so thank you all very much um, and I'm very happy at this stage to take um, any questions if um, there's any questions from anyone in the audience. Um, yeah so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Liz. That was really, really useful and interesting. Um, as Liz said, if you have any questions, pop them into the chat. Um, Liz, are you staying um, for the Q&A session at the end? I won't be able to, unfortunately. I'm on call today, so I do need to, uh, to move on and do some work after this, so uh, I won't be able to stay, unfortunately. Okay, no worries. Thank you so much.
If there are any um, particular questions come later on in the session, though, Emma, by all means, forward them to me and I can, you, through you, reply to, to people if there's things come up later. So um, either any questions now or anything that comes up later, just forward them to me in due course. Very happy to do that. OK, perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so before we go for a quick break, um, I'm just going to quickly put up a poll on the screen about having your virtual consultations throughout the pandemic. Um, so if I just quickly launch. So hopefully you should be able to see that. Has anything come up? Yes, we can see it, Emma. So the question is virtual consultation. Perfect, thank you. Uh, virtual consultations are widely adopted by many rheumatology units during the COVID pandemic. Which of these statements best describe your experience of consultations during the last 18 months? My appointments were cancelled and I had neither a virtual nor face-to-face -face rheumatology consult consultation since. I have had one or more telephone con consultations with either rheumatologist or specialist nurse. I have had one or more video FaceTime consultation with my rheumatologist or specialist nurse. I have had both phone and or video appointment followed by a face-to-face -face visit to the hospital. As I was experiencing a flare, I have been seen face-to-face -face in the hospital by my consultant and or nurse. I had a face-to-face -face routine appointment at the hospital with my consultant and or nurse. So as you can see, 61% have said that one or more telephone consultation with a rheumatologist or nurse. 10% um, of you haven't had anything, which, you know, is quite worrying. 10% um, have had a video or phone call followed by a face-to-face. -face. Another 10 have 10% um, have seen a face-to-face -face, um, when they experienced a flare. And another 10% of you um, had a face-to-face -face routine appointment at the hospital, which is good to hear. I will now stop sharing and we will now quickly go into a comfort break. We, we didn't start um, doing this until January and then we ran very quickly to try and get a clinical trial up and running where we could give vaccine um, to individuals and what we were really asking was if you uh, have a particular um, condition, disease, etc and you are being treated for it, and there's inflammatory aspects or autoimmune perturbation associated with your disease, what does that mean for your response to vaccine? That's what we really need to understand is how well do these vaccines work in people? And what we did was we took several courts, and this is why it's nationwide, we took inflammatory arthritis, um, and within the inflammatory arthritis, we actually had rheumatoid arthritis um, as one of the inclusion criteria. We had psoriatic arthritis, but we also had vasculitis as well. And we were looking at, we had to be very um, uh, careful in who we were choosing and how many, because there's only so many people we could vaccinate. So we had to restrict it to either people who are on methotrexate or people who are on methotrexate with um, anti-TNF. And that was in the RA and psoriatic arthritis and the vasculitis that actually people are on rituximab because that would have a big impact on the immune system, you know, because it targets the B cells. That was what we were doing in Glasgow. And we married this up right across the country with patients with hepatic disease. So if they had liver disease, renal disease, so they'd had kidney disease, and these could be on um, dialysis. Um, also for cancer, we had solid cancer, we had uh, blood cancer, and we had stem cell transplant patients as well. So you can see what we're trying to do is get a broad spectrum right across all the various different conditions that where we know for a fact there's either immune perturbation or immune suppression and you know when we think about that we think of the stem cell transplant patients or the renal patients whereas obviously with the ra and the psa we think there's immune perturbation which could have an impact on how well the virus is doing and let's see if i can change my slides um so this just i put this up just to give you an idea of the extent of the the study so um as I said, Professor Ian McInnes is leading this chief investigator. We've got Stefan Siebert in Glasgow for all the rheumatoid inflammatory disease. We've got the solid cancers and the blood cancers down in Birmingham and Leeds. 
We've got renal disease in Imperial College in London. We've got Oxford University there with a the liver disease and so on and so forth. And we've got lots of investigators in this. And I'm sort of leading the lab aspect, really trying to understand what's happening in individuals when they're A, they have a disease and B, they're getting treated with things that we know will have an impact on the immune system. And we're looking at it in very many, many different ways. Um, and the primary, as I already mentioned, the primary objective to this was really to understand the magnitude of the response with these chronic diseases and also secondary immunodeficiencies. And we're looking at both um, the antibody response. So obviously, you, you know, you're all hopefully well aware of, you know, looking at antibody responses for vaccines. And we're doing this with very standard assays and actually Public Health England uh, helping us run those assays. So we're collecting all the samples and we've been doing this over the last few months and we're sending samples out to Public Health England who will run very carefully controlled assays to look at the serology. And we're also collaborating with a company called Lots of Biodynamics who are looking at the T cell response. So this is the cellular response. And I've sort of just thrown up an image here. What you can see is if there is no response, usually you'd get, this is a, a, a well on a tissue culture plate, you'd get pretty much no spots. And then when you've got a response, and this is about the, the ability of these cells to secrete a particular cytokine interferon gamma, you get all these really nice spots. And at the end of the day, the assay is just counting the spots. And that tells you how responsive not only the B cell responses, which produces the antibodies for you, but also the T cell response, which is what supports the B cells and can also provide protection. In addition to those primary ones, we're also doing this. We've got a secondary outcome, which is if people have been vaccinated and we can look at their immune response, do we actually see any natural infection coming subsequent to vaccination? And that'll be an important question we'll look at over time. We've also got a lot of exploratory objectives that we're looking at in this context, which is investigating various different aspects of the immune response. It's all well and good to look at antibody responses after vaccination, um, but we also need to understand whether those antibodies are functional. And there are re some really nice assays, and I have colleagues at the, can uh, the Center for Virus Research in Glasgow who can look at whether these antibodies that are produced in individuals can neutralize and block virus entry. And it's called this pseudo neutralization assay, you can see it at the top. So we can see the functionality of it, which is a good surrogate for protection. We're also looking at more aspects of serological and mucosal immune responses. Again, remember this is uh, a, a virus that you know, you'll get through the respiratory tract, which can go into the lung. So the mucosal response is really important as well. So we want to look at that. And we're gonna characterize things in a different way. I'll, I'll, with time, I'll not go through all of them. The last slide, and I, I'm already looking at my time, I've already taken up six minutes, surprising how time quickly flies. I thought I would give you an idea of what, what we're doing in terms of visit schedules to, again, give you some context about what we're trying to do to, to understand. We're collecting samples at baseline, which is just before we're vaccinating people. We're then actually letting people have that, you know, that immediate initial um, response for a while. And then we're going to call them back. And we have already called a lot of patients back for a boost. Just before we give the boost of the vaccine, we're taking another sample. And then 28 days post boost, we're taking a third sample. And then finally, six months time after that boost, we'll take a, another sample. And that one is really to look at longevity of response. How well does the immune response last? Because that's going to be an important question that we really want to tackle, which is, and you've probably seen it in the news, is it enough to get the two doses or do we need to give a subsequent revaccination later on to make sure we maintain responses? So what we're trying to do in the baseline, the pre-boost and the post-boost is understand A, if someone's had a natural infection before they've even got the vaccine, if you get the first vaccine, how well does that give you a protective response? And then if you get that initial boost, do you get a very good response 28 days later? Now we've split our cohort into two different groups. We've got a deep immune profiling group, which is um, basically 150 people per cohort. So that's 150 with inflammatory arthritis, 150 with cancer, 150 with the hepatic, renal, et cetera. We're also doing just a serology group, and that's gonna be 850 people per cohort, where we're just taking samples at day 28. And what we're intending to do is do a lot of, inf get a lot, huge amounts of information on this deep immune profiling group, which we can then extrapolate to our serology group and understand the extent across a lot more people. So didn't have much time to go through it, but rough, hopefully that's giving you an idea 
of what we're trying to do to really understand how well vaccination is going to work um, across the patient populations that we really care about. And we appreciate that everyone's concerned, you know, A, with the disease, A, with getting treatment, how does that impact my ability to respond to a vaccine? And I think we're starting to get some tantalizing data coming through. Unfortunately, you know, as I said, we only started in January and we're currently getting the samples for our day 28 post boost, but I don't have any data to show you yet. We're running as quickly as we can to generate that. And we'll try and get that out as soon as possible because I think it's going to inform a lot of um, public health policy um, so we can really make sure that the appropriate regimes are given. And I think I'm looking at the time. I've already taken nine minutes. So I'm not going to get on to my second one. The last thing I would say is that with this study, what we're using is the approved vaccines. So we've been using Pfizer, AstraZeneca, um, and some of the questions that we'll have based on this is if this goes well and we see very good responses, but we think that revaccination needs to happen. Again, you'll have seen it in the news. People are talking about whether do you mix vaccines? And one of the things that we're wondering is if you, if you let's say for instance, this is just an example, you're given the AstraZeneca over two doses. Should you get a third dose, which is AstraZeneca, or actually should you change to something like the Moderna or the Pfizer or something else that's coming through? So I'll leave it at that and pass on to Mario Lucia so she gets her full 10 minutes. And I will be around for questions and, and, and later on um, to talk about anything you, you want me to know. So I'll stop sharing now and hand it over to Mariola. Okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, so my name is Mariola Krowska stolarska and in that I work in the same center like uh, Carl. So what I want to show you today, it's a, um, the science that uh, people in the world are excited about. So it's like a new technology which everybody is hoping can uh, help uh, develop cures mm -hmm. to many disease, including uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So just to remind you, most of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis know this by heart is that there are a lot of unmet clinical needs in uh, array. So not all patients respond to current treatments, although we have a big selection of the treatments. Some patients stay in disease remission uh, upon the treatments, but many of uh, patient flare. There is no cure and there is no prevention. So many 20 years ago, um, scientists and clinicians, they were excited about the human, human genome project where we sequence uh, human genomes and then started to look at the via, uh, variances of different genes. And this led in 2014 to identification of 102 genes which are associated with RA. But unfortunately they contribute, but doesn't mean that if you have this variant, you will develop arthritis and doesn't mean that if you don't have, you won't develop rheumatoid arthritis. So, this knowledge um, help us to develop the therapies we have now, but unfortunately um, uh, didn't cure uh, array. So where is the current gap in knowledge that don't allow us to understand the pathogenesis? It's because we don't know all the cells, you will be surprised, but we don't know um, all the cells in the joint. So in 2015, around this year, the new technology arrived where allow us to uh, identify every cell in every organ and actually look at what the cells does. So look at the phenotype of the cells. So this is called single cell profiling or single cell sequencing. So how do we do this? So we can isolate cells from the tissue. So a uh, synovial biopsy, for example, and then to every cell we attach um, a unique barcode. So we will be able to follow these cells. And then we do a lot of uh, analysis, in you, uh, including um, uh, we look at the genetics of the cell and also we look at the different elements of the cell. So it builds sort of like a behavioral phenotype of the cell. And then using computational methods based on the genetics, based on the other elements the cell have, we sort of can group them in, in a different groups based on the similarities or differences. So we started to use this uh, method a few years ago. And um, so to describe to you the group we are based. So um, Carl mentioned that we work in the same center. It's a quite nice center. It's a research into inflammatory arthritis center funded by Versus Arthritis. 
uh, race. And this is sort of consortium of four universities in UK. So Glasgow University, Oxford University, Newcastle University, Birmingham, and also Gemali Hospital in Rome. So our group is built from uh, two um, sort of leaders. It's a clinician, Dr. Stefano Livernini from uh, Gemali Hospital and me, scientists. And we have a big group, which is mixture of clinicians and scientists. We have a lot of PhD students and also postdoc, and it works pretty well, although Brexit sort of um, prevent us meeting together. So this picture comes from Madrid when we met last time in 2019. Okay, so what did we do? So it's not only us, a lot of people are building uh, uh, tissue atlases, including joint cell atlases, but we focus on one cell type. The cell type is called macrophage. And uh, so you have the picture here of the healthy joint, you have the bone, the cartilage, and you have the, um, on the side, you have synovium, which protects your joint. And of course, in array, you have the massive grow of the synovium, where there is a lot of inflammatory cells, including these macrophages. So what we did, we uh, take a, a biopsy from many patients at different stages of disease. So with active array, not responding to the treatment and the patient who responded very well and went into remission. So we take the biopsy from the joint. It was more than 200 um, uh, biopsies. And then we performed this single cell analysis to find uh, different flavors of the uh, macrophages. And indeed, if, sorry, something I see. Okay. And indeed we found based on this method, nine different flavors of the macrophages. One type of the macrophages, which we know uh, from many years, are uh, macrophages which actually drive the inflammation in the joint. And the new things that come up out of this technology is that we found out it's not only one macrophages which drives the inflammation, but there are many different types, so at least three. But uh, this did not much uh, increase our hope for new therapies because actually the therapies you use like adalimumab, etanazep, infliximab, tocilizumab, and so on, target specifically uh, these cells. But what was new is that we also found in the joint macrophages, which actually perform a good job. So they actively keep joint inflammation free. So they can prevent the inflammation and they can resolve inflammation. So our uh, work now focuses on how to use them as a therapy, either boost their function or whether we can expand them in vitro and put back to the patients. And the other interesting thing, which is important for clinicians where they sort of manage patient treatment is um, that we calculate that when there is the ratio of the Merck positive macrophages to the Merck negative macrophages, it's below 2.5 in the synovial biopsy, and you have increased odds of developing a flare. So the numbers are not important, but if you have this uh, wrong mixture of the macrophages, it's very likely that you develop flare. So uh, currently, uh, the Stefano Olivernini is testing it on a, a bigger uh, patient cohort, whether indeed in this prediction will hold uh, in, a, in a different patient cohort and other centers are testing in a different countries. And uh, myself and my PhD student are trying to find the way to boost activation of, of uh, these macrophages. And this, this to uh, show you that this is effort of many people um, so this was published last year in Nature Medicine, and this is all the authors in Gemali and University of Glasgow and Trace, which were involved uh, in this work. So like Carl, I will stay for the question session. So if you have a question, I would be happy to uh, respond to them. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Carla Mariela. Um, I am now going to pass over to Elsa Bosworth, our NRAS founder and national patient champion. Uh, well, good morning, everybody. And uh, what a fascinating presentation we've just had from our friends in Glasgow. Wow, it's so great to hear about um, the, the, the really important work that's going on in research. Um, so when I stood down as chief exec in 2019, um, I found myself in the very fortunate position of being able to write my own job description, not something that happens to you uh, very often uh, when you've just become 70. So um, I was really thrilled to be able to take forward the work um, that I'd been 
doing over the last 20 years in, in building NRAS and, and focusing on the things that I'm really passionate about. So self-management um, and um, implementing some of our new services, which I'm going to tell you about a bit today. Um, so one of the main programmes that I've been working on in the last um, 18 months is Smile RA, which Claire touched on earlier, and I'll tell you a bit more about that. Um, I've also been uh, helping to support the team working on the Right Start programme uh, and some of our other NRAS uh, services, particularly the Go Scotland, um, which I'll also come on to and tell you a bit about some of the results from the pilot that we've run there. Um, I continue to work uh, on improving access to um, care and services and medicines through the work that we do with NICE on health technology appraisals, Scottish Medicines Consortium, which is the, the NICE equivalent in Scotland, as you know, uh, British Society for Rheumatology and, and work with ULAR. Uh, and we support a lot of research activity, as, as Claire has said. We do our own social research uh, on the things that uh, impact our RA and, and uh, people's lives with RA. Uh, including things like emotional well-being, work, and, and all of those important issues. And uh, we're also um, continuing to work on uh, improving our assets for the South Asian populations in, in the UK, which Claire has also talked about. And I also um, help support the rest of the team wherever my knowledge as a, a patient of 40 odd years um, can help um, support our activities. So SMILE, um, this is SMILE. Uh, we're launching it in RA Awareness Week in September. Um, and so far uh, we have um, a, a foundation module which bas basically talks about the um, importance of self-management, what it's all about, and also includes um, the evaluation, the RA uh, impact of disease questionnaire because we want to be able to evaluate this program properly. Um, the first modules that we've done are a found, the foundation module, a newly diagnosed module, a meet the team module, so telling you all about who the multidisciplinary team are and what they all do uh, to, to help look after you, uh, a managing pain and flares module, which has, is just being built at the moment, and just about to start writing um, a medicines and treatment module. So we will be, as Claire said, we will be adding modules as we go uh, and we will be launching them as they are completed, but we will have at least five modules to launch in September. Um, it's, as you can see from the slide here, it's, um, it's using our branding, it's using um, our, our NRASCAL characters, it's using video, it's interactive, um, and lots of uh, uh, contributions from health professionals and from patients. So I hope that um, when we launch, it's going to be a program that you will all be able to access and, and really use to, to your advantage by selecting um, the modules that are important to you at the time and, and of interest to you at the time. It's got a Netflix uh, style interface so I think most people are, are familiar with that kind of thing. So you'll be able to click on um, uh, the picture of the module and, and, and just get going. Um, the initial feedback that we've had from um, some testing that we did last year, just on the look, the feel, um, the navigation and so on, was really very positive. And the only um, things that, that people mentioned were very cosmetic and that we've been able to, to fix. So overall, really pleased that uh, so far it's, it's had some good, good feedback. Um, on to, to, to Go Scotland. Um, Claire has, has mentioned this this morning and um, this is the Zoom platform where we collaborated with Fife um, to convert what was our six week group face-to-face self-management program that had been running for a number of years and which Fife had very much championed in Scotland. Um, and we converted that into a seven week online platform uh, with Zoom and the, the first pilot has just recently completed. Um, we were also joined in that, in that pilot by some patients from Lanarkshire and also their senior uh, occupational therapist who, who participated. Um, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of feedback in a moment, but, but basically 100% of the attendees said they would recommend the course to others, which is always a good, a good sign at the end of a programme. 
and uh, they found that the, the way the information was presented was useful and the length of the course was, was about right. So each session was an hour and a half long. So here are some of the, um, the, uh, the feedback that we've had from various participants. I'll give you just a moment to have a look at that. It was delivered um, by Nadine, our um, information and support manager, in conjunction with Fiona Lovegrove, who is a recently retired specialist nurse from Fife, who'd been running the the face-to-face -face programs. Uh, and the, the two of them working together in partnership in that way was um, really, I think, very good. And, and that was in fact how we delivered the face-to-face -face program. So having that health professional and lay tutor working in equal partnership, I think is a, is a good way to deliver programs. So where next for um, Go Scotland? Well, as Liz mentioned, um, we are talking to Liz uh, at the moment and also to Health Improvement Scotland about the possibility of incorporating both our Right Start programme for newly diagnosed and our Zoom programme into um, the Scott QR registry. Um, we're just in the in the process of, of having discussions about it at the moment. So um, there's a question mark over whether there's going to be ongoing funding for Scott QR, as Liz mentioned, um, and uh, we will have to wait and see what happens, but we would very much like to get this Scott, this program going right across Scotland and uh, just watch this space. We'll let you know how we get on with that. Um, so I mentioned it, working with NICE uh, and with the Scottish Medicines Consortium on looking at, uh, the, well, making sure that the patient voice is represented when these drugs come to market and um, the current drug that we are working on um, with SMC in Scotland at the moment is uh, upatacidinib, which is one of the new JAK inhibitors. And our ambassador, John Patton, and I are uh, working on a, a submission to the SMC. And uh, John is normally the one who actually attends the SMC meetings when the appraisal actually goes through their processes. So we will continue to, um, to work uh, in partnership with our ambassadors in Scotland to ensure that the patient voice in RA is represented at that level. Um, Claire mentioned that um, a paper had just been published last week. Uh, I was the lead convener um, together with my colleague Eleanor Nikki Faroo, who's a consultant at, at King's, uh, and we've been working over the last couple of years uh, with a task force from across Europe uh, 11 countries were represented and we had health professionals in all disciplines and uh, patients working with us. And basically what I wanted and, and what kicked this whole um, task force off was my desire to see the ULAR recommendations incorporate a more um, holistic view of how patients should be treated rather than um, focusing as often happens on the on the clinical medical model where much of the consultation is taken up with looking at your medicines your DAS score uh, your blood results and so on and uh, I wanted to try and incorporate uh, evidence-based self-management strategies for health professionals uh, within the ULA RA recommendations to try and um, as I say move more to a, a holistic model of care and um, we hope that by uh, the publication of these standards uh, and these recommendations, which we will be presenting to ULA at the June conference this year, um, that um, all members of the rheumatology multidisciplinary team will be able to provide and signpost uh, a more appropriate level of self-management support for patients and be assured that it has the evidence base behind it. And ultimately, the goal is to improve patient outcomes. So I hope I'm within my 10 minutes, Emma, <laughs> but happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elsa. Um, and again, if you do have any questions, put it into the chat um, and we'll ask them at the session at the end. So I'm now going to put up um, a couple more polls um, about self-management. 
Let's just launch them. So the first one is thinking back to your first year following diagnosis, would you have liked to be offered the opportunity for an online self-management course? Yes, no, or not sure. And the second one is irrespective of how, however long you have been diagnosed, would you like the opportunity of going on an online self-management programme in 2021? And again, the options are the same, yes, no, or not sure. And majority of people said that they would for both of the answers, um, which is very good to know. All of these polls are very um, important, important for us and it is good to know where we can put our time into. Um, so this is really interesting. So thank you so much for answering these. So, and once again, thank you so much, Elsa. Um, that was really interesting. And we're very glad that you did give yourself this role when you step down as CEO. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Janet Brewer, um, NRAS's engagement manager, to inform you about our Scottish NRAS groups. Thanks very much, Emma. I'm just going to check you can see my screen when I share, if that's OK. Yeah, we can, Janet. You can. That's brilliant. That's great. And just going to check that the slides work OK. Will be one second. There we go. And just checking you're just seeing my slides. Is that OK? Yes, that's correct. Lovely. That's fantastic. Thank you, Claire. Um, right. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Emma said, I'm Janet Brewer and I'm Engagement Manager at NRAS. Um, and I'm delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you about our NRAS groups, uh, which follow our objectives of uh, support, which is peer to peer support in this case, um, empowerment and in providing information. So I joined NRAS just a few weeks before the pandemic hit. So not quite the start I'd envisaged, but I have to say it's been a real privilege um, to work with such a dedicated team of NRAS staff and volunteers uh, who've been committed to supporting those living with RA during these challenging times. So moving on to our, our current groups. So we currently have three act active NRAS groups in Scotland, which are Glasgow, Dumfries and Galloway and Edinburgh and Lothians. Unfortunately, Edinburgh and Lothians was just getting going before the, the first lockdown started. So we hope today will pro provide us with an opportunity to relaunch the group um, and attract more support for those working to establish it in the area. So we all know that COVID-19 has had a great impact in terms of the delivery of face-to-face -face support. And of course, no in-person NRAS group meetings have been able to take place for over a year now. And this coupled with the fact that many of you will have been shielding has led to many people feeling isolated and alone. So what has NRAS done to try and fill this gap? Well, Claire will already have mentioned to you about the Facebook live sessions and the coronavirus section on our website, which was constantly updated. But I would just like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit more about our Here For You Telephone Volunteer Service and our forthcoming Wellbeing Online courses, as these will be additional benefits available to you whilst the groups get really up and running again. So the Here For You service was launched back in April 2020 as a quick response to help people with rheumatoid arthritis through the coronavirus epidemic. Because many of those of you living with RA and wanting to use our services were worried, feeling isolated and urgently seeking information. We were able to set up this service quickly as all the volunteers were sourced from our existing peer-to-peer -peer support volunteers who had already completed comprehensive training. 35 of those 51 volunteers signed up to hear for you when approached and all received online refresher training and specific information related to COVID-19 issues. And as Claire has said, the service was a wonderful case of people sticking together when times get tough. So in a nutshell, NRAS is here for you currently offers a friendly chat over the phone 
with a volunteer who also has RA. They will check in on how you are doing, lend a listening ear and give you ideas for activities you can do at home to keep yourself well. As mentioned though, the volunteers have already been trained to offer more focused support depending on their own circumstances, medications and interests and we will be incorporating this support under the Here For You umbrella as we move forward. But if you or anyone you know would like a Here For You call, you can find a self-referral form on our website. Also, over the last 12 months, we've seen an increase in interest in well-being activities to help with self-management of RA and have run self, several, self, uh, sorry, several well-being introductory sessions covering many different topics. And starting in June, we'll be launching a series of new five to six week online courses, um, which will be available to purchase through our shop for a nominal charge. Now, all the experts running these courses have RA themselves. And the first, cover, the first courses will cover mindfulness and meditation, nutrition and lifestyle, resistance training exercise, and singing for well-being, which I'm sure many people will enjoy. So more information will be available on our website soon, but you will be able to indicate your interest for further information when, receive, when you receive your follow-up email after this gathering. So back to our groups. To facilitate our groups keeping in touch with their members over the course of the pandemic, we launched a pilot scheme, which helped them publicize and run online meetings via Zoom. And Irene, who leads the Dumfries and Galloway group is part of this pilot, pilot scheme. So each group was given a dedicated NRAS email address. So for example, Dumfries and Galloway at nras.org.uk and access, access to an Office 365 portal through which they could manage their email and file storage activity. So after training in GDPR and Zoom and Office 365, the groups were given access to contacts in their area so they could invite them to a first meeting via Zoom. NRAS staff offered further support as and when required, and this support is ongoing. So we found actually many positive outcomes to running the meetings online. Many groups have now had two or three meetings and are finding this new way of working is, is bringing many benefits. They are seeing more attendees at meetings as there's no geographical or wellness barriers. And one group that often had only 12 attendees coming regularly to face-to-face -to -face meetings is now seeing around 60. Groups are also collaborating to increase the offerings to attendees. So for example, our Oxford and Banbury groups have teamed up. The Oxford group are organizing speakers from the local rheumatology research team. And the Banbury group are organizing online well-being activities such as chair yoga. This online option does not mean these groups will not meet in person again too when the situation allows. In fact, it will allow them greater flexibility in terms of contacting attendees about options for in-person meetings. So moving on now to your specific groups in Scotland, if you would like to join the existing Glasgow or Dumfries and Galloway groups, then you can contact our volunteer coordinator, Naomi, in the first instance. And, and this will come through again in your email, so don't worry about having to take details down at the moment. Now to the Edinburgh and Lothians group. Now, as I mentioned earlier, unfortunately, the group didn't have time to really establish itself before the pandemic hit. So we are now looking to relaunch the group with the help of our Scottish ambassadors, including John Patton and Sheila Terry. So we're looking to recruit two dedicated group coordinators to work together with our ambassadors, John and Sheila, and other original organisers who are still able to help to re-establish the group initially online. So anyone interested in becoming one of these coordinators, you will complete the GDPR Zoom and Office 365 training online 
and then work with ourselves to set up the first online meeting and to invite potential attendees from across the area. The intention would be for the group to then hold perhaps monthly or bi-monthly online meetings and occasional face-to-face -face meetings. Again, Emma will put my contact details in your follow-up email if you would like an informal chat about this opportunity. I'm just going to briefly mention here ambassadors as well, because our policy and comms manager, Samuel, unfortunately couldn't make today's meeting, but he's asked me to mention that we are still positively encouraging more applications to become NRAS ambassadors from members across Scotland. It's an important opportunity to help us raise awareness of RA and to support us with campaigning on relevant issues. You will be given full training and induction, and you can email me in the first instance if you are interested, and I will pass on your details to Samuel. So not only have we set up the pilot online regional group meetings, we are also developing new topic-based digital groups for those living with RA, which will cover the whole of the UK. We will be launching the first groups, JIA parents, 18 to 35s, well-being and exercise, and potentially, and potentially an at-work group at the end of June. Again, if you would be interested in setting up a topic-based group, please do get in touch. We also recently set up a Room for Inclusion board to raise awareness of MRAS among diverse and underprivileged communities. And we are looking for new members to join this group. So again, contact me if this might be of interest. So as I just come to a close, nearly there, um, you will have received emails in the last few months about our new website, which, we are, which are, we are very excited about. We have now have a volunteer section where you can see all other current opportunities we have available. And you can click on those, bring up the information and, and submit your interest. So just to say thank you so much for your time today and to say Naomi and myself are always here if you have any inquiries regarding our groups or regarding volunteers in general. Um, and um, I think I'm now, um, I don't know if there's the opportunity for um, questions at the moment, Emma, or if those are coming at the end. Um, we have got a couple. Um, are you able to stay for the Q&A session or would you like to answer them now while I put up the poll questions? Um, if I could answer them now, that would be fantastic. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, of course. Um, so the first one is, why do you think there are so few groups in Scotland? Oh, <laughs> that, that is a very good question. Um, I think um, because of, um, I think there are kind of, um, geographical um, issues with some of the more remote areas and, and I think hopefully being able to move activity online is really going to help us address this. Um, I think um, you know what what we have found as, as I've said with the online groups that have got going is that people have said to us you know originally um, I didn't have a group close enough to me uh, that I could travel to whereas online I still get that sense same sense of community of being able to talk to other people living with RA um, and you know it can we have had groups do social meetings as well Claire came along to a a Christmas party that we had online with one of the groups. So um, yes, I, I think you know that if we can start digitally, um, and that may allow us to increase the groups across Scotland. I hope that answers your question. Great, thank you. I think that's basically um, led into the next question: is can you join a group if you're not in the area? As there's um, nothing for North East Scotland, so yes, um, um, online. Yes, thank you. Yes, I think, as I said, I think the, the answer would be pretty much the same. I think, um, you know, you could join uh, the nearest online group, even if it was several miles away, because I think it would still be relevant to you. It would still give you that peer to peer support. Um, and as I say, you know, being online, it, it just break down those geographical barriers. Great. Thank you so much, Janet. And now I will just quickly put up the polls that um, you 
asked me to do. So it's if you were to join an NRAS group in Scotland, would you like the meetings to be online only, face to face only or a combination of the two? So 85% of people said that they would like a combination of the two and 15% said online only. So I think online is definitely a good way to go as well. <laughs> Oh, that's great, Emma. Thank you so much. Yeah, that that's really useful. I, I think one, one thing that we do want to say as well is that we know online is not a substitute, a total substitute for face to face meetings in person. And, you know, we do want to reassure everyone that, you know, that will be a part of it as well. So thanks very much. Thanks, Emma. Great. And thank you so much for your time as well today, Janet. Thank you. So we are now going to go back into another comfort break. Um, but to kind of lead on to our next presentation, we do have a question um, that we would like you to discuss if you feel comfortable enough to do so. Um, so the question is, what are your strengths that help you with your condition? And hopefully, you know, you might be able to get some like, tips and tricks from each other. Um, but obviously, if you're comfortable to do so, please do share that uh, with your group. Welcome back, everyone. I hope that you all had a really good discussion in your rooms. Um, I'm now going... I would now like to introduce Dr. Emma Weber and Adam McKenzie from the Five Rheumatic Diseases Unit to discuss, to, to discuss emotional and psychological well-being in inflammatory arthritis. Once again, if you have any questions, please put them into the chat for the Q&A session at the end. So over to you, Emma and Adam. Okay, so myself and uh, my colleague Adam are going to give you a, a bit of a whistle-stop tour, I suppose, of what is a, a very large and important topic. Uh, but we're hoping today just to, to give a real sense of some of the common difficulties that, that certainly we see in our rheumatology clinic from a, a psychological and emotional level, and also start to think about you know, some of the more formalized approaches to helping people with these difficulties and some of the more uh, self-help and self-care strategies that can be, be used as well. I do just want to mention though, before we, we start, um, that the discussion of these sorts of issues can be hard to hear. So I suppose, I think there's trigger warnings on everything at the moment, you know, before we see any, any sort of a TV programme or, or listen to anything, there's this thing, a, a trigger warning of, you know, you might feel triggered by some of the, the things we speak about today. And I suppose this is just my own um, trigger warning. And just to say, look after yourselves when you're listening to this. If you, if you feel that, you know, it, it's bringing up things for you and you, you don't want to continue to listen, that's okay. Go off, get a cup of tea and, and come back. Uh, or, or just notice and be aware that, you know, this, this stuff may well bring up difficult feelings for you, but hopefully through some of the strategies we're going to talk about, that's something we can offer you some signposting to, you know, to get some further help if that does happen. So today um, we're going to talk about why is addressing psychological issues important? What are some of the challenges and difficulties faced by rheumatology patients? what psychological interventions have been shown to be useful and linking in with some of the previous discussions about how can we um, involve ourselves in, in helping self-manage some of these uh, difficulties. So the research tells us and certainly my clinical experience also tells me that psychological problems are a big part of long-term conditions and, and rheumatic disease. We know that people with long-term conditions generally are two to three times more likely to struggle with their mental health. And I think that's really quite a startling figure. We know that having psychological difficulties, particularly unidentified or untreated or unaddressed psychological difficulties, really interrupts your ability to self-manage. So, you know, of course, struggling with your mental health may disrupt your ability to get some exercise, to eat well, to even attend appointments and sometimes even take your medication. So it's really important that these things are asked about and seen as relevant and important in the, in the management of um, medical conditions. 
We also know that not treating or ignoring psychological problems actually increases overall treatment costs because we know that these impact the effectiveness of different treatment options. So let's think about RA particularly. Um, the, the figures vary widely in the research, but up to 60% of RA patients may be diagnosed with a depressive illness. And, and again, you know, I think these figures are startling and even more startling when we see that we only have two psychologists in uh, Scottish rheumatology services. I'm not sure what, what the situation is in England, but you know, it, it's, it's not great either. A very interesting paper speaks about how RA patients uh, with untreated anxiety or, depre or depression are less likely to reach remission, even with the gold standard of medical treatment. So untreated psychological issues impact how effective the drugs are, just in the same way as obesity or smoking may impact how effective drugs are. And just treating um, RA in a medical way doesn't improve mental health outcomes at all. So I think that's another important point to, to think about when designing services as well. Psychological support is recommended in NICE guidelines. Again, as mentioned, you know, we don't strictly subscribe to NICE in Scotland, but you know, we, we, we certainly um, take note of it. Um, studies have also shown that if offered, patients will access the support. I don't think that's a surprising one. And we know that patients are on, you know, constantly looking for understandably validation and support from the team. And sometimes it's just not there in a specialised way or there's not specific time or specific staff that are you know, there to provide that. So it's really a, a, an unmet need in a lot of services. And the evidence shows that many of the issues that, that people will present with in rheumatic diseases are amenable to change and are you know, possible to help and possible to treat. So I think that only adds to this need you know, to, to have these resources available for people to access. So the model we use in Fife is that we have psychology embedded within our rheumatology team. And I think there's some huge benefits of that. Now I recognize that this is not the place for me to be flying the flag for psychology in teams. I've, I've done many presentations across various teams in Scotland to really push forward this agenda. And this isn't the place for that. But I do want to just mention that if you have a psychologist embedded in uh, the team itself, it really does start to increase the awareness of psychological issues. So even though I won't see every patient that attends rheumatology, having discussions about psychological issues really raises awareness for all our clinicians. And I think that's important because emotional health is everybody's business, really. It's not just the business of the psychologist. It's for all the clinicians to be aware of. It provides lots of opportunities for joint working, whether that's groups run jointly, we've, we've jointly run fatigue management groups in the past, uh, maybe even doing joint assessments to think about the different issues and how they interact. I think having psychologists there uh, really helps support future developments such as our self-management pathway development in Fife, which has been psychology led. And it's also an opportunity to provide training for other professions, not only on the psychological difficulties experienced by our patients, but also about our own psychological reactions. And, you know, particularly within a pandemic and thinking about burnout and all these issues that might affect uh, the way that, that we care for our patients ultimately. So let's think about some of the challenges, and this won't be an exhaustive list, but certainly in my clinical experience, these are the, the more commonly um, presenting difficulties. So maybe around medication adherence, and that can be linked to, to phobias, to previous traumatic experiences, dealing with side effects, fears about what the medication may feel like, what the long-term effects might be. So lots of anxiety around that. Um, Obviously, pain is a, is a massive theme, and that is something that, that um, often patients present to me with and, and difficulty coping with that pain. Fatigue, how to deal with flare-ups and the impact that has on, on life. Difficulties around mobility. Um, 
And I think, you know, the changes and, and the losses that are there around previously enjoyed activities and trying to adapt to maybe not being able to, to climb three Monroes in a weekend, um, but to still be able to draw out some pleasure from activities and, and to pace, you know, pace the level of activity. Changes in relationships, that's a huge thing. Changes in sexual function, you know, this isn't talked about enough. People, you know, will maybe save that for the psychologist. I believe these questions should be asked routinely because this is all contributing to our well-being and our sense of identity, I think. Um, changes in role, maybe within the family, linked to, to working or not working, for example, parenting issues, grandparenting issues, difficulties with decision making, maybe due to, to brain fog um, and, and cognitive di difficulties. As I've said, you know, clinical levels of anxiety and depression. And, and the last one, which is I, I want to spend some time on, which is, is actually a history of, of trauma. Some of you may have heard of a study looking at adverse childhood experiences. Um, it was a, a huge study conducted in, in the United States and then replicated in, in the UK. And it was really looking at the impact of childhood experiences, particularly traumatic childhood experiences on later physical and mental health. And there was some startling results from these studies, which I, I see in clinical practice you know, impact our, our patient group routinely. These are some of the topics, some of the, the categories of what may be classed as an adverse childhood experience, uh, childhood experience and um, a questionnaire measure was developed around these, these different issues. So you can see how broad and, and varied this is, um, and it might not necessarily fit our preconceived ideas of what trauma is, but, you know, these are all classed as childhood experiences which may understandably cause distress um, within the child. So you can see there uh, addiction, various forms of abuse, uh, mental health issues in the family, um, neglect, a, a household member maybe in, in jail um, or, or parental loss or domestic violence. And, and sadly, these are you know, all very common experiences. So what the original study found was that as the number of adverse childhood experiences increased, the risk of experiencing health conditions in adulthood increased. And as I said, this has been replicated in this country. So if you have four or more ACEs, so if you said yes to four or more of the, the, the 10 questions, you're twice as likely to develop cancer than someone with a score of zero. An A score of four or more, you're 460% more likely to face depression in adulthood. And with six or more, your lifespan could be shortened by 20 years. So how does this impact autoimmune diseases? And, and we, you know, what, what does the evidence say around this? So compared to people with zero, those with two or more were at 100% increased, increased risk for rheumatic disease. And in women particularly, um, each ACE score increase, increased the likelihood of being hospitalised with an autoimmune disease by 20%. And particularly in lupus patients, the higher number of ACEs resulted in a worse disease status. So there are lots of different opinions about the mechanisms that might uh, in, it might be involved with um, increased ACEs and later physical health problems, but it has been proposed that the you know childhood trauma can cause damage to cells and how those cells develop. Um, we know that chronic and toxic stress, so not just one stressful event, but you know being in a chronically stressful environment, does lead to the dysregulation of stress hormones, and that has an impact on inflammation within the body. We also know uh, through neurological studies um, that toxic stress also impacts the way that a baby and a young child's brain develops. So there's lots of mechanisms involved here that might explain um, these results. 
So yeah, I'm, I'm racing onto the next slide there, but you know, I just I just want to mention. I suppose it was these slides that I I wondered about how triggering they may be for people, and I'm not suggesting that um, psychological services within a rheumatology team, for example, can always offer exactly what is needed to help individuals with these difficulties. But I think within the NHS, we are becoming a much more trauma informed workforce and there's a huge drive within Scotland to become more trauma informed in the way that we, we deal with patients. And with that, I mean every single clinician um, to be aware that the person in front of you may be presenting with trauma symptoms as well as their physical difficulties and just to always hold that in mind in our interactions and particularly around medical examinations and investigations which can be re-traumatizing for some people. So in terms of the, the evidence, we know that mindfulness-based therapies um, have been shown to be useful particularly in, in pain. Um, acceptance and commitment based therapies um, also have a developing evidence base, particularly amongst physical, physical conditions, uh, chronic pain, uh, depression and anxiety. Cognitive behavioural therapy, and again, these are huge topics and I realise I'm just skimming over them at the moment, but they may be words that you have heard or will hear in the future. So a, a very strong evidence base there, particularly around fatigue, uh, depression and feelings of helplessness. And it's been shown that, that uh, within rheumatic disease, um, being able to, to receive some CBT can also increase active coping and adherence to medication. And it would be often one of the main therapies that I would use. Psychological in interventions involving multidisciplinary approaches, um, such as fatigue management, which has elements of CBT, relaxation um, in it, as well as more traditional, traditional occupational therapy approaches to, to pacing, for example, have shown very promising results in improving fatigue impact and, and coping and the perception of severity of RA. And that, that's an approach that we use regularly in our team. There are different ways that psychological interventions can be delivered, so either in, in group uh, settings, um, you know, a whole team approach where different professionals can be trained in basic uh, CBT models and, and uh, not necessarily full blown therapies, but certainly approaches, or indeed, as we have in Fife, you know, the opportunity for direct referral to a clinical psychologist. So. I'm going to pass on to Adam now because Adam's going to talk more about uh, our self-management approach and um, you know thinking about how we can help ourselves uh, to approach psychological dif difficulties perhaps in a less formal way than I've presented today. I'm hoping I'm hoping to tie all of this together in in how we can start to consider psychological um, principles and, and, and your emotional well-being when, when we think about this supported self-management approach. And, and I'd like to also say that it's really optimistic for me to see um, how, how much self-management as, as a strategy across Scotland and by the looks of it across the UK as a whole has, has really come along even in the last year or so with um, the talks with ULAR and, um, and other services. Um, so I think that bodes really well for, for um, the, the, the approach and also in the conversations um, throughout, today's, um, throughout today's group sessions um, around, around what people are currently doing to, to cope. Um, so you'll see some of those come up um, in the talk. But for those who are maybe less familiar or new to the concept of self-management, um, we consider self-management as the provision of, of education and support interventions to increase people's skills and confidence in managing health problems. So it's not about managing things on your own or just getting on with it. Um, it's certainly not about putting up with, putting up with it. It's about um, working with people collaboratively, be it health professionals, friends and family, your work colleagues, um, and most importantly, yourself uh, as 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 an active 
member in, in this team um, who are all looking to support you um, with a, being the expert with the lived experience to, to manage your condition, your, your arthritis well, um, despite the challenges and problems uh, that, that you may encounter. So this boils down to uh, learning a bit more about your health, um, your overall health and developing skills to be able to cope. Uh, these will be skills that, that are personal to you and that work for you. Um, and in many cases, evidence-based practices uh, are a good place to start. And as you begin to practice these, um, the hope is that you'll, you'll begin to build your confidence in, in your ability once again to cope well with your condition. So at least early on, we, we tend to focus a lot on the physical element of, of arthritis, particularly pain management um, and getting symptoms under control. But as Emma has highlighted, there's a, a, an emotional component to all of this. Um, and it's quite difficult now actually to separate our emotional um, and psychological well-being from our physical health and our social health because all of these constantly interact with one another um, and and affect uh, your your relationships uh, to all of these these areas um, so for example when we're looking at your emotions and we're looking at your um, your psychological well-being uh, when we think about a new situation um, in this cognitive behavioral model um, that Emma had, had uh, brought forth earlier. Um, when a new situation, situation arises, we tend to have automatic thoughts about said situation. Um, and, and these thoughts are accompanied by emotions um, as well as physical feelings. And these thoughts and emotions affect our decision-making, our behaviors. And we know that decision-making is one of the big factors in how well we cope with our condition, uh, how, how we adjust to the, the challenges that, that are presented. And so taking this into consideration that, that our decisions are so important, it brings to light how important our thoughts and our emotions are to this whole process especially when we're, we're considering self-management as, a, as a, a, a strategy for, for, um, for managing. But what does this look like? Um, the answer really is that it can look different to, to everybody. Um, we in NHS Fife like to draw upon uh, this, which we call the self-management jigsaw. And you'll see in each of the pieces of this jigsaw that, that we, we refer to a different strategy, uh, some of the strategies that you might already be familiar with, like prioritizing uh, your tasks, making plans for your tasks, and, and being able to pace yourself throughout. Um, and other things that are a bit more practical, like medication adherence, um, exercise and sleep, that there's evidence to suggest um, can have a positive impact on inflammation levels. But each one of these is just one piece um, of, of a larger puzzle. And, and when we first look at a puzzle scattered across the floor, it, it can be a bit overwhelming. And, and um, some pieces are more clear uh, to us than others. But when we think about health and we think about managing arthritis, we think about it as a process of um, learning, of trial and error. Um, and over time, as we begin to fit these pieces together, figuring out what works for us um, and, and adapting certain situations or adapting the way we approach situations, we, we'll, we begin to see that things start to fit together in place, fit, to, fit into our routines, fit into our lives and, and um, fit into our relationships with other people as well. Um, and at this point, we can then start to see a bigger picture forming and, and we can also start to really appreciate the hard work that we're putting in and so so from this slide I think what's more important than the specific examples in each jigsaw is actually the jigsaw itself and, and what this represents in terms of how we begin to to manage such conditions 
when we're thinking about um, these particular strategies and, and focusing on our emotional well-being and, and how important it is for our physical health as well. Um, Emma mentioned about stress and how important stress is, how, how, how significant it can be in terms of our inflammation levels um, within the body. And we might at this point all have our own coping strategies for stress. Some we find um, are readily available to us, whereas some are maybe more to uh, reduce stress long term to avoid the, 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 the emotional impact of surprise situations occurring. Um, and there's certainly evidence to suggest that managing stress in your life can help to manage the emotional impact of a condition, um, particularly conditions that involve inflammatory responses like arthritis. Um, so some of these techniques involve relaxation, relaxation of the mind, relaxation of the body. Um, and, and when we take a little bit of time to step back, that tends to be when, when our stress levels can really come down. And as stress comes down, we begin to be able to think a bit more clearly, coming back to this idea that our thoughts and our emotions inform the decisions that we make. So some evidence-based techniques that you can try um, are muscle relaxation, deep breathing, which is um, a really practical um, and useful tool to have because it's very discreet and can be done anywhere. And also visualization exercises, which can help us um, to identify thoughts, but also distance ourselves from them and, and, and separate our emotional attachment from our thoughts, which again allows us to think a bit more rationally before we make decisions about our health. If you're looking for a more practical, a uh, more integrated approach that, that involves all of these different techniques um, and something that you can do consistently over time, I'd really, really recommend um, trying out mindfulness. Mindfulness is, um, has a growing popularity and, and evidence base to suggest that um, with even five to 10 minutes of, of daily mindfulness practice, meditation practice, we can reduce our stress levels and really improve attention, reduce inflammation, um, and, and significantly improve our well being. Some resources that we would recommend if you're if you're looking to explore further some of the topics that we've discussed, for example, um, how your mental health and emotions might be impacted by arthritis and, and some coping strategies, I direct you towards Mood Cafe, which is an NHS5 psychology designed website, which has a lot of guided self-help resources on a range of topics, including health psychology. Silver Cloud is another good website which offers courses on specific issues related to mental health and long-term conditions as well. If mindfulness is your thing, you won't have any trouble finding um, courses, I can assure you. Um, there are many apps available um, on iTunes and in the Play Store, most of which are free, um, particularly beginner courses certainly are, are free. And some that we would recommend would be Headspace Calm and Insight Timer. Um, also, if you have Netflix, um, Headspace have an introductory course on Netflix, which uh, provides a visual, um, a, a visual aid, um, accompanying the the um, the mindfulness meditations. You've heard talked about already the NRAS School Self Management Program, and um, this is something that we we're certainly promoting across Fife and and hopefully um, across Scotland as well. Um, it, I think formalized self-management introductions are gonna be incredibly powerful moving forward. Um, and, and we will certainly be um, advocating for these um, right across Scotland and right across the UK. It's certainly really, uh, once again, optimistic to see that there's such an appetite for that. And if you are interested um, in going away and, and looking for a bit more information on self-management and how you can begin integrating self-management into your journey, we have some videos that we've designed um, through NHS Fife Rheumatology Service. 
These were mainly designed for people who are newly diagnosed, um, but there are some videos that I think might be really appropriate in this context, um, namely the introduction to self-management and becoming a good self-manager videos. Um, these can be found on YouTube, but you can also go to the NHS Fife Rheumatology website um, and find them there. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for listening. Um, and, and at the end of the session, both Emma and I will hang around to field any questions that you have. Thank you. So I'm now I'm delighted to pass over to Morag McDade to give a brief introduction into Tai Chi and then a very short session, Tai Chi session, um, and which you are welcome to join in for. Hello everybody, and um, I hope this sound is okay for you. Um, my little headset's been playing up a little bit, so if uh, if it needs me to take it off and just speak a bit louder, uh, perhaps someone will let me know. Um, so I've been doing Tai Chi for a long, long time, um, coming into three decades now, but um, my main um, focus for the last several years has been Tai Chi for Health and Tai Chi for Arthritis. Um, Dr Paul Lam's wonderful programmes that um, open up Tai Chi to everybody. And if you haven't heard of Tai Chi, it's, um, it's an ancient Chinese, um, first of all, a martial art, um, but also widely, widely practised for its health and relaxation benefits. Of course, that's the side we are doing today. It's gentle, slow, low impact, fully adaptable for all. These programs have been adapted specifically so that nobody can get hurt. So you're going to be gentle with yourself. You're going to take tiny steps. If you don't feel like standing up today to do this little um, practice with me, you can do it from a chair. Um, you can lie down on the sofa and do it and just visualize the bits that are not moving. Visualization being such a wonderful thing. Um, one of the wonderful things about Tai Chi, and I was really interested in listening to Emma and Adam speaking about self-management, um, just even the exercise aspect of these Tai Chi programs, there's the part of the jigsaw, the exercise, and also the other part, which was the mindfulness, were both combined here. So Tai Chi relaxes the mind as it gently exercises the body, strengthening muscles to, to just help support those painful joints. Not when you're in a flare up, then you would use visualization. Um, when the flare passes, you can do more, but always keeping within that safe zone for you because everyone's different. The wonderful thing um, I think with regards to arthritis is that exercise releases endorphins and these endorphins are chemicals that just help you to feel good. They're natural to the body but you're releasing them if you like um, and they have the ability to, to reduce your perception of pain they distract your mind um, and make you feel better and more positive. Um, and just again to um, come back to the word visualization, it's immensely powerful. And if you use visualization and mindfulness together, then you're doing whatever the thing is that you're maybe just beginning to try and do, you're doing it fully in your mind. If your hand doesn't want to go higher than this, even though you see my hand here, you put your hand here, put it where it's comfortable. So I'm going to stand up and go a little bit uh, further back from the camera so that um, I'm in the frame for you. Um, and I'll try very hard to keep to time, although it is hard to condense um, all of this stuff because it's really quite, um, it's, it's, it just, sometimes I forget to stop talking, but I've got a big clock in front of me, so I promise to stop um, at the appropriate time or as near as possible. So for those of you who are standing up to join me today, just find a wee space about the same size. Can you see my little mat behind me there? That's about 
six feet by four. If you've got a space that size, that's wonderful. If your space is smaller, it will adapt the steps. So don't worry. Um, and that's all I'm going to say, apart from we'll start with a little gentle warm up. Again, do what you can, just do the bits that feel good. The important thing is we're going to relax first. So just follow me. After the relax, after the uh, warm up, we're going to do a tiny little bit of Tai Chi flow, flowing movement that I hope you maybe remember and try for yourselves after this wonderful day. So please join me. So if you're able, I'm going to ask you to stand with your feet just about shoulder width apart. Make sure you're nice and comfy. So your knees aren't locked, they're just loose. A wee bit like the suspension in a car. If your knees are locked, then that has an effect right up through your body. So just soften them. Come up now towards the hips, just use your mind. And we're just going to tuck the tailbone under a little, just a tiny movement. And then we're going to come up through the spine, lengthening gently, just naturally, the way your spine likes to be, but your spine doesn't really like to be like that. It likes to be like that. We're going to allow the crown of the head to rise towards the ceiling. Just a centimeter makes a difference. And we're going to lift the shoulders just a tiny bit, and then we're going to let them melt. Now, when you did that, your fingertips got a wee bit closer to the floor, whether you're sitting or standing. Um, I'm going to give you a wee visualization just now of something that might help you to feel relaxed when you're standing like this. Have you ever seen a grizzly bear in any of these wildlife programs? I'm sure you have. And normally a grizzly bear walks on all fours and he walks with a big clumpy kind of pigeon toed walk. But when he wants to see a bit higher over a bush or something, or he wants to attack someone, or he's facing an attack. He stands up to his full height, which is about eight feet. But there's an interesting thing that happens, even though the skeleton is beautifully tall and erect, everything else goes south. Oof. Now you should feel that all the way down to your feet. You're a saggy baggy bear. And from there, we're going to do a warm-up, beginning with our neck. We're going to turn our palms, pull them in gently towards your chin. And then just before we get there, we're going to turn them again, push them away. And then we're going to follow them with our gaze as your hands go down, your head gently drops just to your comfort level. And then we do it again, we rise on an in-breath if you can, as you breathe out gently, bring your hands closer. Breathing in again, and then watching as your hands go down. Just gonna do two of these, to each of these today, just because we're a little tight for time. So allow your hands to rise again. One hand comes down, the other one turns in to face you. And we're going to gently turn that one about 70% of where you think you can maybe turn it to. And we're following it with our gaze, just looking into the palm and then bring it back. If you need to move your feet around at any time, then just do so, just do a bit of shifting weight side to side. If standing is a difficulty. Breathing in. Breathing out. We're just warming up the neck. Easing out any tension there. Always keeping everything within your comfort zone. Are you still a saggy baggy there? I want you to roll your shoulders now three times forward, tiny movements. 
and then three times back. Tiny, tiny. Just enough. And then I'm going to bring my palms in front, facing up. I'm going to draw the shape of a ball. Bring my hands to the top of the ball. Press down as if I'm pushing it underwater. Because this is a shoulder exercise. Breathe in. Here's your ball. Have you ever tried pushing a ball underwater? It needs a wee bit of shoulder oomph. Just enough for you. Now I said I was only going to do two of each, and now because I've been talking, I've gone and done three. Oh dear. Never mind. Hold the ball in front of you now. One hand's about chest height, one's about tummy level. We're going to take the lower hand up and turn it forward if you can. Press up gently, press down just a couple of inches. And this is for your spine. We're just gently easing out any little wrinkles in your spine. Imagine you've got a piece of silk, one end wrapped around each hand, and just ease out the creases. Now, as we come back this time, we're going to hold the ball once more in front. This time I'm taking it a couple of inches to the side, just so it sits over that knee. I'm going to turn the ball back and bring it back to the other side. We'll do that once more in each direction. Only your upper body moving around the axis of your spine. Focus on the hands. We're moving down now. Give your legs and feet a wee shake out. We've done the upper body, now we'll do the lower body. So I'm going to press the hands down and I'm going to sink into one foot. I'm going to choose this one. You can do either. If you're able to, take your weight on that foot and bring this heel forward. If that's a difficulty, just visualize. Even just an inch forward, an inch back is fine. And the same on the other side, but first sink. Take the weight on that leg, that foot. Feel it sinking to the floor. Freeing up this one. I'm just leaving the hands out of the way in case that's confusing you. Normally, I'd be doing this. Hands up, toe back. Hands down, heel forward. Now, for our knees, we're going to make two fists. We're going to sink into one foot. And we're just going to take the other foot and stretch a little bit forward, just touching the floor with that foot and bring it back. We're not taking any weight forward, it's just touching. Imagine there's a butterfly there under your toe. That will stop you putting any weight on it. If you're able or if you've got something to hold on to, you could try lifting the foot. But don't do that if it doesn't feel right for you. Just touching the floor in front of the spine. I'm going to do a good one now. I'm going to sink into one foot, bring your heel forward, put your foot down, and then just bring yourself forward. Just sinking as if you're sitting in a high stool and the front knee just bent. And at the same time, we're punching. Come back. One more. Perhaps for the back of your leg, just for the, the uh, hamstrings there and the calf muscles. We're going to fold our hands here now because we're just going to loosen off the ankles a little. We're going to sink again into one foot, concentrate on the other one, heel and toe. Just loosening off the ankle and the same on the other side. Now, I'd normally do that one with a wee kind of big toe, little toe turning towards the floor as well, but we're just going to finish the warm-up by closing our hands ever so gently and then allowing them to spread open. As far as is comfortable for you, I want you to imagine flower buds just opening slowly, 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 just a little more and a little more. And then have a little shake. <clears throat> now, 
having done our warm up, we've spoken to every single part of your body from the tips of your toes up to the top of your head and the ends of your fingers. So everything knows that it's going to do a little bit of Tai Chi. So I'm going to lead you through this little tiny, tiny snippet of Tai Chi. This movement is called Waving Hands in Clouds. And the version I'm going to show you is Sun style, and it comes from Dr. Lam's Tai Chi for Arthritis program. It is, all, it is also bona fide Sun style Tai Chi. It's not, not just um, particular to the program, um, but it's used within the program, and it's beautiful. So with your feet shoulder width like mine, if you can, I want you to bring one hand up like this, and it's facing forward as if you're waving to someone. And this hand is down here. I'm going to sink into this foot, sink. My other foot's going to take a tiny step to the side, hardly anything. And as soon as it touches down, my hands are going to change places. I'm going to turn my waist now so that the weight shifts over to that side. Sinking into my left foot now, bring the right foot, couple of inches closer as soon as it touches down, change the hands, turn your waist back and your hands go too. Sink, step, change, turn. One more, sink, step, change and turn. Bring your hands in front, breathe in, breathe out, focus on the breath. Again, breathe in, breathe out. I'm going to do the same the other direction now. So this hand here, this hand here. I'm going to sink into my left foot this time. I'm going to try and talk a bit less this time so you can feel the movement and just enjoy it. So I stepped out a little with that foot. So that means I change my hands. And then I turn my waist. I'm fully there on my right foot. Left foot comes a little closer. Change hands, turn. Sink, step, change, turn. Sink, step, change. And just bring your hands to the center. I'm going to do a beautiful open and close movement again. Breathe in. Breathe out. We're going to do this one last time now, going this way. So this hand is here, this one is here. I'm going to sink into my right foot. And this time I'm not going to speak at all. Just follow me. And open and close. Breathe in, breathe out. Hands forward, and slowly, slowly, slowly allow them to drift back down. And then we just step our feet a little closer. After any exercise, you must do a little pull down. So take a soft, very soft fist or just the heel of your hand and just tap lightly on those big muscles, on the quadriceps there and the hamstrings. And then two handfuls of energy, strength, good feelings and happiness. And again. And then just gather some beautiful fresh air, breathing in and breathing out. And again.
And one more. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, if you manage to join in, that's wonderful. In whatever position, and even if you were just joining in in your mind, thank you for being with me. So I'm now going to quickly put up our final poll. Um, just asking you um, what you think should be our number one priority for the next three years. Just launch that. So the future of healthcare and society has changed irreversibly as a result of the pandemic. NRAS needs to evolve to remain as relevant to our beneficiaries as possible. What area of work do you feel we should should be NRAS's number one priority for the next three years? So you've got developing and improving access to online J RA and JIA self-management resources, campaigning to address the inequalities of access to rheumatology care across the UK, work with NRAS to embed and have our service, services commissioned with rheumatology services, raising awareness of our J RA and JIA to the general public, increasing our support of clinical research, developing digital solutions, e.g. APPs for monitoring your disease, global campaigning to change the name of rheumatoid arthritis to rheumatoid disease, developing new resources, booklets, videos, podcasts on topics that are not currently covered, e.g. hormones, menopause and RA, moving your rheumatology care, family planning and inflammatory arthritis, older teenagers, young adults and inflammatory arthritis, and developing well-being resources for emotional and psycho psychological support. Share. So the biggest one is work with NRAS to embed and have our services commissioned within rheumatology services. But we do have one, at least one vote for everything anyway, um, which is very good to know. Um, so thank you again for taking part in all of these polls. Uh, it's gonna help us going forward. So we're now going to go on to the Q&A session. I've had a lot of questions into the chat. Um, so I'm going to start with um, Claire. We have a question for you that we had during your presentation. Yes, indeed. Hello. So is the um, other referral services only in NHS England? No, um, uh, the right start can be referred from any of our uh, devolved nations as well it's uh, so any nhs professional can use the referral uh, form on our website so it's uh, very easy so if you would like to talk to your rheumatology nurse or consultant about it just ask them to go on to the nras website and at the top of the page is a refer a patient and that gives you more than information there so anywhere any healthcare professional can refer through that form. Great, thank you, Claire. And we now have a question for Carl. Um, if following the antibody response study, it shows a reduced response, is it likely a booster to be due earlier than the general population? Um, so these are difficult questions because we don't have the answer yet. But my gut feeling is that if we do see that there is um, in certain individuals a decreased response, then the hope would be that you would get a booster before the general population, you know, it'd be sooner. I mean, you, you know, right now in the study we've been doing, you know, government guidelines were for 12 weeks between initial immunization and boost. Within our study, we actually brought that forward. So it was more four to six weeks. Um, so again, I think that we're going to do studies that will identify who absolutely responds, and then that's probably not an issue. There might be people who have an intermediate response, and then there might be people who have a low response, but there's still something, and then there might be people who have no response. And I think probably in the people who have no response or the, the low response, we might want to be boosting their immune system again with a subsequent re vaccination. And my bias would be uh, the sooner the better. Can I just hop in on, on the tail end of that, yeah. uh, please, Carl? And we're getting quite a few people on our, you know, online community and inquiring to Helpline about doing these home antibody tests. And then, mm -hmm. you know, not always does it show, but, and we're, we're trying to reiterate that it's not no. just about 
um, antibodies, it's, it's around T cells as well. What would you, what do you, would you recommend uh, people are aware <laughs> so, of uh, regarding these home antibody testing? I wouldn't personally. I mean, I've had um, two doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine. I would not do a home test to te check my immune response. I don't think it's useful. I don't think it helps necessarily. What we're doing in the study is we're using um, very discrete assays that will tell us, as you just mentioned, we want to understand the T cell response. It's not just about antibodies. Antibodies are great and they're a good surrogate that you've had a response, but it doesn't mean you got protection. What you want is a rounded immunological response and that involves antibodies being produced, but antibodies are there doesn't mean that they're functional. If they're functional, they can stop the virus entering the cells. So the other thing we're trying to look at is the functional antibody response. And there are tests that we are currently evaluating within the study that might be able to go into an NHS setting. So it would actually be useful in, in clinical management where you could say, okay, yes, you've got an antibody that can potentially stop virus entry. And then the T cell response is really important because that's a cellular mediator immunity. So yeah, it's the same thing with, so if you think about all of these tests that people are doing, not only for antibodies, which I would never do, but there are all these lateral flow tests that have been thrown around left, right and center, even just for testing, whether you've got COVID, I wouldn't use them. This is my personal preference. Okay. I don't think they're useful because I think you get too many false positives, too many false negatives. Uh, it's that the people that are putting them out there are probably doing them for the right reasons. But I don't think they're useful. That, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you, Carl. Yeah. All right, over back to you, Emma. Thank you. Um, we have a question for Mariola. Um, how would the positive macrophages be given in a therapy, joint, in, uh, joint injection or similar to biologics? Um, so it's we are far from it yet, but um, the idea we are trying to test is that um, we will find the a factor which drives the activation of these macrophages. So then you will get it uh, in a sort of injection, like you uh, get your anti-TNF um, once per month or something. And other, another possibility is uh, to get these macrophages um, on the Petri dish. Uh, so you might be aware they are cellular therapies um, being developed for arthritis. For example, Newcastle, they are working on cells which are called dendritic cells, which, are, which can change your immune system. So what they do, they take your own dendritic cells, which are not working very well, and then they change them in the Petri dish and then put it back um, to your blood. And uh, the clinical trials show that it may work. So we had the similar idea for um, our macrophages, because uh, in theory, these macrophages can be developed from your skin cells. So you can take skin cells, change them to pluripotent stem cells and drive them towards the macrophages, which resolve inflammation. So we will be testing uh, this option, but yeah, the, the best, uh, the, um, always the best are the simple uh, solutions. So I guess the simplest would be to find what stimulates these macrophages and then you can get uh, through the injection uh, either I guess the, the easier is to get injection um, into arm, like you get the vaccination or um, your anti-TNF. Great, thank you so much. Um, we had quite a few questions come through during Emma and Adam's um, presentation. Um, so I'll just um, mute my, both of you and you decide who can answer them. Um, the first one is, why do consultants tend not to include psychological issues in their consultations? Will I answer that one, Adam? Yeah, sure. Yeah. So I'm not sure what the, the person who asked the question, what their experience has been. Um, it probably isn't the case that all consultants wouldn't wouldn't answer, but there has has been some some studies looking at this. And a lot of it is about time. And I think there's this misconception that if you ask about something, it's then, you know, on an emotional level, it's then going to take a lot more time to discuss. And 
yes, it will. But I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a good reason not to ask about it. Um, particularly when we can see that the evidence that not addressing it um, does have an impact on response to medication and, and treatment. So I, I suspect that's the highest reason would be time. Perhaps there's an element of not feeling skilled to deal with the response. I have had referrals in the past from consultants in our team in the past, and we had lots of various consultants in our team, but uh, I've had referrals because someone was crying. Now, to me, that's not necessarily an abnormal response to a new diagnosis. I think crying would, yeah, would be understandable and reasonable and doesn't necessarily suggest you've got a psychological diagnosis. So I think there is a slight aversion at times to emotions, but thankfully not everyone and not every um, you know, medical professional is like that. But I'm, I'm sorry if that's been your, your experience. And that's why I think having you know, psychological issues on the agenda helps the team recognize this is all part of the picture that it's not just a physical disease great thank you um another one is probably more for you emma because it was in your presentation um could growing up in a household with severe marital issues be a trigger for my inflammatory arthritis so that would be classed as one of the adverse childhood experiences that were, was looked at in terms of, um, you know, domestic um, violence or, um, you know, domestic discord in a, in a household. And I think anything that causes chronic stress and toxic stress in a developing brain uh, and a developing body has the potential to create a, a process that may well result in cellular changes or um, overactivity of the of the immune system. I may be getting into, into you know, a level that I am unqualified to talk about from a medical perspective, but I think, you know, that the evidence is, is there and it's unavoidable. These these studies have been massive um, in what they've shown and have had, you know, had a massive uh, cohort of individuals involved. So I, I don't think we can, de can deny the importance of these experiences and the development of later physical health problems. Carl, did you want to come in on that? I saw your hand uh, raised. Yes. Um, so I raised my hand um, just to come in from the logical level um, to support what Emma's saying. Um, we've been doing a, uh, a lot of work trying to understand how various different environmental influences will affect the immune system. Um, and those environmental influences can be any type of stress, wherever the stress is coming from, will influence it, you know, and then it gets to the the smoking, the diet, just everything and everything that we're all exposed to. So all of us who are exposed to things will change the way our cells um, are configured. So we do the, a lot of studies on things called epigenetics. And these are sort of the flags on our DNA that tell um, the rest of the system whether certain genes are on or off. And those flags can change over time and they will be influenced by environment, which is everything and anything, including the stressful situation. So it, it, these are real things. We have no idea how um, these changes compound over time and it will be different for every single person. Every single person is an individual and their cells will be changed ever so slightly. So even if you had twins, they might not necessarily respond the same way and one could or could not get it. There, we do know at genetic level, people will be predisposed to getting disease, but it doesn't mean that you will. It's all to do with what you're exposed to over your lifetime. Thank you. Um, and I think probably have time for one more considering we've already kept you for <laughs> all for an extra 20 minutes. Um, so we've got one saying acceptance is hard. What is the best tool to use to help accept how things are now in the present? Adam, do you want to talk about, I'm wondering about some of your, your mindfulness. Yeah, um, I think there's a, a few things that you can do. I think um, talking, communicating with, with people around you is, is a good starting point. Um, so so um, share, sharing in the lived experience with, with people at meetings like this um, is a fantastic way of, of 
finding some sort of validation and acceptance of what you're going through um, is unique and individual to you, but it, 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 it might be quite similar. And, and you might find that there are other people that, that have coping strategies that, that might work for you um, or are at least worth trying. And, and certainly um, there's, there's a good evidence base to suggest that mindfulness has an incredibly powerful impact upon um, our willingness to endure um, during hardships. So, so we, we think about our resilience um, when, when, when we experience pain or um, trauma and, and how we bounce back from that. We talk about resilience as a, a protective factor against that. And mindfulness is, is a practice of really cultivation cultivation of coping strategies, cultivation of um, stress release, um, of, of um, almost like de-junking the mind a little bit, allowing your, yourself to, to be able to think a bit more clearly. And, and um, I think sometimes what makes acceptance so challenging are the, the automatic thoughts that, that, that are often accompanied by um, the feeling of loss, the, the, the sense that, that something has been taken away. Um, and, and that can be something that we, we fixate on. Um, and what mindfulness can allow us to do is to disconnect a little bit. It's not a disconnection uh, from reality. It's, it's a recognition that, that what's happened has happened. And now um, the, 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 the productive thing to do would be to focus our energy on things that are within our control that we can change and, and look forward to moving forward. But it's a difficult road. It is. And, and acceptance isn't something that um, is likely to come from one conversation or, or one sentence, although that's not unheard of. Um, we, we do tend to think about this thing growing gradually over time this acceptance and and it can come and go as well and 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 that's okay and that's normal emma do you have anything to add no i think that was a very comprehensive answer thanks adam well thank you everyone um especially presenters for your time today especially on a saturday um it was all very very useful and i hope everyone um took something away from today um, Claire, do you have any closing words you would say? Yes, I just again wanted to reiterate our great thanks to uh, our wonderful speakers for giving up their free time uh, today on a Saturday, having you know worked tirelessly all week uh, in caring for, for patients. So thank you each and every one of you for, for spending some time with us and sharing your expertise with, with so many of us. Thank you all for engaging in such a wonderful way with the discussions in the breakout rooms. I hope you found this really helpful. I know it's a lot uh, of information being shared today, uh, but uh, you know, I hope you'll find uh, elements of it that will stay with you going forward. And uh, so I just wanted to say, you know, for those of you who are members, you'll have received the NRAS magazine. It's just landed. Uh, it's a great, oh, there's, Tracy is sharing hers as well. If you're not a member, uh, do think about how it's just jammed packed with really helpful information. And there isn't a there isn't an advert in sight for a Stena chairlift, I promise you. It's just packed with really helpful information about living uh, your life as full as possible with RA or JIA. So consider joining up if, if you are not currently a member. Um, and do consider about how, what role you could perhaps play in uh, helping us to get the information out there to more people in your locality, maybe helping somebody over the phone by becoming a, a, a Here For You volunteer. Think about perhaps how you could help us with uh, being part of a, the Scottish Ambassador Network. We've got some of our wonderful ambassadors on the, on the call today. Um, on the meeting today, I should say so. But, but we need more. We need more, you know, troops out there uh, being our local ambassadors. So do think about uh, keeping in touch and playing your part. Um, thank you so much for uh, answering the poll questions. That will really help us. 
Uh, I got a little bit nervous when I saw the priorities one because it was a real mixed bag. I was kind of hoping that there'd be some really top three, but it's a real mixed bag. So you're setting us a, a challenging time for the next three years or so as to uh, all the things that you want us to do. We will do our very best, uh, most definitely. So I just want to say thank you once more for all our speakers. Have a wonderful weekend, even though it's pouring rain uh, here at, down in Wokingham in Berkshire. And I just want to say, keep well, keep safe, keep positive in the mind, but definitely keep staying negative for COVID. And uh, wear the masks, the NRAS mask with pride and keep yourselves safe. And please God, we'll be able to uh, book in for next year to actually see you, many of you in person. So thank you very much. And thank you to Emma and Tracy for all the organising and bringing the whole uh, event together uh, for us today. Very well executed. Thank you very much. Good night. Oh, thank you, Claire. Night. Oh, good day. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone.